Hi, this is Manos Brilakis from the Minneapolis Heart Institute and the Cardiovascular Innovations Foundation, presenting case 95 for the Manual of Precutaneous Coronary Interventions. This is a case of an inferior ST segment elevation myocardial infarction in which uh, the right coronary artery could not be found. The patient was an elderly woman that uh, presented with inferior ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. There is fairly pronounced ST segment elevation in the inferior leads with reciprocal depressions in the lateral leads and the precordial leads. And in cases like this, of course, the primary PCI is the preferred strategy. The question is, do you go straight to the culprit lesion with the guide or first inject the non potentially non-culprit vessel? And this is our approach. If it's an anterior MI, we would typically go in straight with the guide catheter, do PCI of the culprit lesion, and then do a diagnostic angiogram of the right coronary artery, the rationale being that findings on the right are unlikely to affect what we do on the left. However, if it's a non-anterior MI, like in this patient, we first prefer to do an angiogram of the left main in case, first of all, it could be a circumflex causing the inferior MI, but if not, if there is significant, for example, left main disease or three vessel disease, that might affect how we do PCI of the culprit lesions. For example, if it's an RCA with three vessel disease and left main that will eventually require bypass, we might do balloon angioplasty only of the culprit lesion, and then the patient uh, may subsequently go for coronary bypass graft surgery. So in this case, we first did the diagnostic angiogram of the left main. There are lesions in the circumflex on the LAD, but uh, uh, there is no culprit lesion here. But then when we tried to engage the right coronary artery, we had a hard time. We could not engage the right coronary artery. And what we can see here is a cusp angiogram, so essentially having the JR in the right cusp and injecting straight in the cusp, not selectively engaged, hoping to see where the origin of the vessel is coming from. And in this case, we can see some staining here. We get a sense of where the right coronary artery likely is. However, it's hard to see exactly what is going on. And this is the algorithm when there is difficulty engaging a coronary artery. The first question to ask is whether the location of the coronary ostia is understood. If we can clearly say, yes, this is where the coronary is, then it becomes an issue of catheter manipulation and catheter size and shape selection. But if not, then the alternative approach is to actually get some imaging to understand where the uh, missing coronary artery is. What we did in this case is a cusp angiogram. Another option is to perform a full aortogram, 20 cc's for 3 seconds for a total of 60 cc's, usually in the LA of U, to understand the origin of the coronary artery. Once we understand where the origin of the coronary artery is, then we might use different techniques, such as um, uh, longer sheaths or yeah, diagnostic catheters, or uh, use guide extensions or various catheter shapes to actually get to engage the vessel. And when it comes to the right, there are variations of the origin of the right. These are some of the variations of the anomalous right coronary artery. It can come uh, from the posterior sinus of Valsalva. That's uh, fairly infrequent. The most common one is uh, the right coronary artery coming from the aorta, typically in a superior and downward pointing, pointing takeoff, and uh, a little less often to come from the left sinus of Valsalva. In this case, we changed to a multipurpose, and we were then able to engage the right coronary artery, which seems to be coming higher from the aorta and has a downward pointing course. So this is essentially an anomalous origin right coronary artery coming high from the aorta. The next uh, management is um, standard for thrombotic lesions aggressive uh, antithrombotic and anti therapy. Here the patient received uh, heparin as well as ticagrelor, and then uh, restoring coronary flow, first wiring and ballooning with a small balloon, and then determining if there is a large thrombus that would require thrombectomy or not uh, before performing standing. So in this case, after a small 2 balloon was used, there was restoration of undergrade flow into the right coronary artery. 
And then uh, there was a large amount of thrombus, that is why an aspiration catheter was used. We can see a temporary pacemaker, the patient did have uh, bradycardia during the case that actually subsequently improved after recanalization. So after thrombectomy now we see much better the vessel, this is a large coronary artery that was successfully stented with a 3.5 drug eluting stent, providing a nice final result. So here are some lessons from this case. The first one is when there is difficulty engaging, the first question is to understand where the artery is coming from. And if it's hard to tell based on uh, the movement of the catheter, the options are to perform a cusp angiogram or an aortogram to understand the ostium of the vessel. This was an emergency, so we had to figure it out in the cath lab. But sometimes, if it's an elective case, and it's extremely challenging to find a coronary artery, another option might be to stop, perform a coronary CT angiogram to localize the coronary artery, and then bring the patient back. Because sometimes it's actually not an anomalous coronary artery, but instead it could be an osteal flash occlusion of the artery that can be fairly hard to find on coronary angiogram. So the key options are, is it an anomalous coronary artery? Is it coming from an unusual place? Or maybe it's occluded flush at the ostium. And then uh, in terms of the right coronary artery, the most common anomalous origin is a high takeoff from the aorta. And that was what we found here in this case of inferior ST segment elevation myocardial infarction. Thank you.